Amen. What a wonderful joy to be here. Good evening, everybody, and a great uh, honor for me to be at the Cornerstone Baptist Church. And I've heard much about the church through uh, Sister Vicki Hitt, and I believe she has some relatives here this evening as well. All right. And I have to be very cautious what I say this evening uh, because her mother is, yeah, I see her back there. <laughs> So if I tell her to put her fingers over her ears, then you'll know why. Uh, but it is a joy to be here. My name is John Gray, and this is my wife, Melissa, and we're on our honeymoon, by the way. All right, we were married 12 days ago in Orlando, and uh, God has uh, blessed greatly not only the work of Papua New Guinea, but uh, given me another bride. I lost my first wife to cancer several years ago, and God's opened up a great opportunity as uh, he brought Melissa into my life, and God has blessed it greatly. And 12 days ago, we uh, tied the knot in Orlando and been on our honeymoon ever since. All right, and we're grateful for what God has done. A few weeks more here in the country, and in August, we will be back to Papua New Guinea once again. She has been teaching in Orlando at Victory uh, Christian Academy there in Okoe on the west side of Orlando and I've been in Papua New Guinea so it's been a bit of a long distance relationship about 12,500 miles worth and uh, but God has blessed and uh, we're grateful for what he is doing. Just a little bit about the work and the ministry and then the pastor asked me to preach and that's exactly what I'd like to do here this evening. Uh, God has blessed the ministry there in Papua New Guinea and for the last 27 years he's raised up a lot of men families, teachers, health workers, pilots, and others that have come over to help us in the work of what we call reaching the Gulf. Now, the Gulf is one of the provinces of Papua New Guinea. And for the last 25 years, uh, that's exactly where I have lived, in the Gulf province. The Gulf province is probably the most remote province of Papua New Guinea. Other provinces of Papua New Guinea have airstrips and roads and bridges, all these niceties that we don't seem to have too many of. But in the Gulf province, it, it's just a neglected area. And it's full of mosquitoes. Yes, it's full of a lot of diseases, which, thank you. <laughs> and already two boys asked me, do they have any crocodiles? Put your hands over. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they do. Uh, I just admire, we have a lot of crocodiles. In fact, we have some big crocodiles. And I got a lot of crocodile stories. And uh, by the way, I haven't started preaching yet, so don't start the timer. Uh, but I did. <laughs> we do have a lot of crocodiles. I noticed in your church building, your new church building, it looks great. I was there just yesterday and praising God for what he has done. And I see the map. Finally, I can view exactly the property there. And it's just excellent. God is given you a wonderful piece of property and it's given you men to help you and supplied needs and I was just looking at those tall walls in the church building and some of our builders here can help us I think they're 16 foot and the last crocodile I saw was about 18 <laughs> Anyway, we do have a lot of crocodiles. Yeah, we do have a lot of mosquitoes, and we do have a lot of crabs, mud crabs. You like mud crabs? Wow. We live in a mangrove swamp, and for the last 25 years, that's where I live, right along the Coral Sea in the Gulf province of Papua New Guinea in a small little sleepy place called Karama. It only has about a little over 3,000 population right in that little area, but uh, they speak one main language there, the Tairuma language, but outside of that area, there's about 26 other languages that are spoken. And our province holds a little over 100,000 people, but we live in a place where nearly pushing 8 million. God is blessed, though, over these last many, many years. And he has enabled us to go to this remote place, and there was no one else there. First, I lived in the capital city, the city of Port Moresby, about a three-hour flight from uh, Brisbane, Australia, in fact. And I lived in the city for several years, and God one day burdened my heart. He brought a lot of things into my life. And you've got to understand, that's how God works. He knows how dumb we are sometimes. All right? He knows how stubborn we are sometimes. Might as well say amen to that. And he knows sometimes we rely upon our own thoughts, our own thinking, our own intelligence, our own everything. 
And God has his ways. And God used many circumstances to take me out of that capital city. Hey, I was, we started churches. We, I started a Bible institute. I saw my first group of graduates graduate. And many of them are even are pastoring right now in the capital city and other parts of Papua New Guinea. God is blessing their ministries abundantly. But God didn't want me there. God wanted me to start there. God moved me on to this remote place called the Gulf Province. And in the Gulf Province, things are very difficult. And we have, first of all, no access by road. Just, but recently, within the last year and a half, we finally do have that access. But for the first uh, 23 and a half years, uh, there was no road access at all. We had to fly in. The great thing about that is that we have an airstrip just right by the house, right by the church. So that's excellent. Bad part was, it's very expensive to fly. But the good part is, they put the road and they connected the road in. The bad part is that there's no more flights coming into the airport. And the other bad thing is, is that it's a seven hour drive to the capital city where we buy most of our supplies. And the other problem is, it's a rough road. It's not sealed, it's uh, unsealed road, it is rough. Some parts are bad, sometimes it gets washes, washed away, sometimes the tide comes in from the Coral Sea and it covers it, and the silt then is underneath so that the road starts to cave in. And so I want you to pray about something. And again, I need to relate a need to you, and that's my job, all right? If, if no missionary ever related a need, then you would think missionaries don't have any, all right? But I do have a need, a very great need, and I need some people to pray about it. That's your job. So I present the need. I need you to pray about it. Uh, I've had to hire vehicles to travel that road now, and so Melissa and I need to purchase one, and we're going to do that as soon as possible, and I want you to be in prayer about that. Vehicles are expensive there, just like everywhere else, just like here. But I want you to pray and ask God that he would supply that need very quickly. Because we get back in, uh, we leave in August, go to Australia, then we go up to Papua New Guinea, and then it's like we've got seven hours between us and the house. And we need to get her there, we need to get our cargoes there, and I want you to pray that God would meet that need of a vehicle, a four-wheel drive vehicle, for us to be able to have good access up and down that road into the Gulf Province. Also, it would help me get to Vicky. all right, if we had that. So I want you to pray for that as well. And Vicki has been a tremendous blessing. And I want to thank her family that's here. I want to thank the pastor. I want to thank you and others who are part and are close to Vicki. We've got a sister here as well uh, playing the piano for us this evening. vicky has been a tremendous blessing of tremendous blessing. And what we do is that we not only begin churches, start churches, we also train men to go out and start churches as well. Besides that, many years ago, God burdened our heart for a Christian school. So we started the very first one in the Gulf province of Papua New Guinea. The name of the church where I live is the Charity Baptist Church. So we called the name of the school the Charity Baptist Academy. And God has blessed it greatly. We've seen many graduates, and uh, the school has grown. And over the years, we've brought in teachers from the U.S. to be there part-time, one year, sometimes two years. Some of the teachers have come in for three years. Sometimes they'd be men. Sometimes they were ladies. Uh, and the last couple of years, God even brought in some to do an internship from the colleges that they were graduating from here in the U.S., uh, this last year, God opened up the opportunity for Sister Vicky to come. And such a sweet girl, talented girl, and takes after her father in talent and all, and I'm sure. <laughs> Amen. Anyway, she's been such a blessing, and she just jumped into the ministry. She didn't stand in the corner and, you know, suck her thumb and say, what am I supposed to do? You know, she just saw it and she jumped into it. It's like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to tell you. No, she just jumped right into it and uh, she has been doing an excellent job there. And there has been a lot of difficulties. We have power, but sometimes it's just not there. Uh, again, like the pastor mentioned, internet services and water and things like this. Many times they're there, many times they're not. <clears throat> 
Right now it's rainy season. It could rain for days and days and days without even stopping. Uh, again, it brings in all the other creatures that like to crawl on the ground, all right, into the house and close to the church. And uh, it's just a very, very remote place. And Vicky has jumped into it and has been excellent and has taken on a great responsibility. And I want to thank her and her family, uh, really personally and publicly here this evening, and say thank you very much for sending her. But at the end of the year, she'll be back once again. Praise the Lord. But the need for teachers in a Christian school, in a remote place, in a swamp, in the country of Papua New Guinea, in the Gulf, that need is still there. That need is still there. You know what God has done over the last 25 years? God has allowed the ministry that we call Reaching the Gulf Ministries. God has allowed us to bring in 50 missionary families. It's just unbelievable. All of them, except for two, have come from the United States of America. And not all of them have come to the Gulf province. Some of them have. Some of them are nurses. Some of them are teachers. Some of them are preachers. Some of them are pilots. Some of them are other types of workers and skilled laborers. God has brought them in, and they have put themselves all over the country. One of the men we brought in is Brother Terry McGovern. I see his name there, there in the back wall. So Brother Terry is a good friend of mine, and we brought Brother Terry in as well and others, and they are serving all throughout the country of Papua New Guinea. The problem with this is what? The problem is, is that we need more. We need more laborers. We need also skilled laborers. I have a man that I'll see in just a few weeks in northern Michigan, Lord willing, and he has a desire to come over to visit Papua New Guinea, but he's good with his hands. You know, I'm good with my mouth, all right? Uh, but uh, when it comes to building, you ought to see what I build. Uh, in fact, you better not see what I build. I'm not a builder. You know, I was saved when I was 12. Before I was saved, I was a bad boy. After I was saved, just a little bit of a bad boy. All right? I was a boxer for about four years, and then I graduated high school, and then I went off to school, and then I got married, then I went to Papua New Guinea. So all I know how to do is to hit people. I can very successfully hit people. But, you know, I can preach a little bit, teach, yeah, but I... Hit people, you know, when it comes to, you know, building a building, when it comes to, you know, surveying, when it comes to engineering, when it comes to electrical work, when it comes to plumbing, I had to get the books out, brothers. I had to look it up many times. Hey, I wired my whole place that I live in. I wired it from start to finish. I did. And everything works, but I had to, I had to learn, I had to teach myself. We are in need of skilled laborers. Listen, I had a group of termites come and visit us. Now, I don't know how you are in Florida with termites, but I don't, I'm not from, I'm a Yankee, you have to forgive me for that, all right? I'm a Buckeye from Ohio. Good. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I had some support this evening, all right? Uh, we had a group of termites come in under the ground, wherever they came from, and all of a sudden they started eating everything. I mean, everything treated wood, pressure treated wood. They would eat through concrete. They'd eat through anything. They'd eat the glue out of books and Bibles. They ate clothing. They would eat the plywood behind the wall and leave the paint. And if the wind would blow, you would see your wall moving. <laughs> yeah, serious. She's been there. She can tell you. We've had to tear out walls, tear out ceilings, joists, tear out studs, tear out the bottom plates, tear up floors because of termites. And we have been in a mess. Our school building that we built was termites, eight part of that. My office has been eaten with termites. The house I'm fixing up to move my new bride in, that has been eaten. And the place that Vicky lives in as well has also been damaged very greatly. So slowly by slowly, we have drilled, we have trenched, we have put chemicals in the ground, under the slabs. We have spent an unbelievable amount of money to do this, and now we're finally seeing the activity die down. But now it's a rebuilding time. I mean, who's going to come and help me? You don't want to put a hammer in my hand. No, don't do that. I hit people, remember? <laughs> I don't hit nails. I hit, anyway, we need people. 
skilled people. Maybe God is working in this way in your life. Maybe you know people that God is also working. We need medical workers. Now, I can take a stone, ask my wife, and I can stand right where my house is, where our school building is, where Vicki, your sister, is working, and I could take that stone and throw it and hit a hospital. I am that close to a hospital. But I'm going to tell you something. If you, I, I would never want to go to that hospital if I'm sick, especially. <laughs> It's just run down. They're building new buildings, but everything on the outside is new, but everything on the inside is still the same. They're not well-trained. They're not dedicated. If you're sick, they're not there. You wait for them. It's, it's bad. We need people who work in the field of medicine to help us in the Gulf province. Now, besides the little place that I live in, and by the way, I haven't started preaching yet, by, by beside the place that I live in, we have sent out pastors and mission workers, nationals, to go to other places of our province. Now, it's bad where I live, and sometimes it's a bit worse where they live. And these places are very, very remote. Now, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to say, you know, you have to... No, I'm, I'm just trying to tell you something, that there are great open doors all throughout our province and many other provinces as well. Where Brother Terry's at, God has opened a great door there. Many years ago, even before Brother Terry was even there, I traveled through that area and it was hard and people were not receptive. People were not responding and Brother Terry gets there with his family and God's opened up great doors for him. This is happening all over Papua New Guinea. And I'm grateful for 27 years that I have been able to live there. And I'm trying to tell you what, it's never been a sacrifice. Not yet. I'm still waiting for that part to come. So don't ever believe anyone when they stand up here and they say serving in the will of God is a great sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice. It's a joy. In fact, it's an adventure. A great adventure. And one little boy, two little boys just came up to me before the service uh, I was out here in the back and they, they said, do you have any crocodiles in Papua New Guinea? And I said, yes, I do. And I said, I can't tell any stories because I don't want to get anybody afraid and scared and especially certain people. And so they said, oh, will you tell me one story? And so I went to tell them a story, but it got interrupted. But before I preach, I'll tell you this little story just to help you a little bit. All right, when our airstrip was open and we could fly in and out and we did not have the road there, that's my only way that I could get out of where I'm at. I could fly into the swamp. I could fly out of the swamp. And if I went by sea, our sea is very shallow. The waters and the waves are very rough. It's just very dangerous to travel by sea where we are at. We're also in a delta area. All the rivers run into our place as well. And it, it, it just causes a lot, of, a lot of trouble if you try to travel by sea. So I had to travel by plane. Well, one of the last times I traveled by plane... I got in. I was tired. It was just time to go. I had to get to the city. It was, you know, we only have one flight anyway, so it was the first one and the last one. So it came in, and the, it took about, it's a twin otter, in fact, the airplane, double-engine twin otter, holds about 18 passengers, and it was full. It was absolutely full, and I was like the 18th passenger. It went to the west, picked up people. It came back to our place, and here I am squeezing myself in this plane, Finally, I got my briefcase, you know, the most important thing in your life, there in this hand, and, you know, the Spirit of God's in me, and that is the most important thing, too, there in my heart, and so got my salvation, my briefcase, and I'm ready, and I jump on the plane, and the plane takes off, and I'm not in the last seat, but I'm in the next to the last seat, and so I close my eyes, and the flight is 50 minutes, so a little under an hour, so I get to close my eyes for nearly an hour, which is something missionaries don't get to do very often, all right? And I'm closing my eyes, and all of a sudden, the people behind me are fighting. And I'm thinking, now why would you fight on a plane? You know, that doesn't make sense. These were people the pilot picked up at the West, national people from Papua New Guinea. And I know that there was a man back there, and his wife was sitting next to him, and a little girl was sitting next to her. And I'm thinking, why in the world would you fight? You know, it, we get up to 7,000 feet above sea level, and then we're there about 30 minutes, and then we go back down and we land in the capital city. So here we top off, top off at about 7,000 feet. Got two pilots in the front, 
you know, it's, we're at 7,000 feet. They get the newspaper out, you know, 30 minutes, they're going to have a read. Every seat is full. And I close my eyes again. I could hear these people behind me fighting. And I thought, I thought to myself, couldn't you just wait till we landed? I mean, if you're that mad at her, can you just wait till we're on the ground? If you need help, I'll help you hit her. I just don't fight on an airplane. That's just not the appropriate place to fight on an airplane. And so I close my eyes again, and here it goes, yelling at one another. And I look, and all the other people are looking back our way. And I'm thinking, I better do it too. Maybe if they see my eyes, you know, with fire coming out, they might stop fighting. So I turn around and I look to the back and the man is there in his seat. And his wife is sitting right next to him. And the little girl is sitting in the third seat. But their feet are not on the floor. Their feet, they're perched like a little parrot. Their feet are on the seat. They're standing in this little plane on the seat. And I'm looking back at them and I'm thinking, what kind of people do we have on this plane? And I'm looking at this man and he's got fear in his eyes. And I look at his wife and she's got fear in her eyes. And I look at the little girl, she's just a crying and a crying and a crying. And I'm looking at their feet on the chair and I'm thinking, how weird is this that they would stand on the seat, you know, for 50 minutes? And the man looked at me, and he just went, pointed the downward direction. And so I just, you know, nonchalantly. And there was a crocodile. It was small, a baby. It was about maybe two and a half feet long. Loose. 7,000 feet above sea level. A baby crocodile loose on that plane. And it was snapping at their feet. That's why they were perched up like a little parrot. And I couldn't, but I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I thought, what in the world? I turned back around, and there's fear in all these other people's eyes. There, there's a policeman on there as well. And he's, he's an, and there's other, they're all looking at me. Like, you know, I took this when I was in Bible college. You know, what to do when there's a crocodile loose on the airplane? You know, how stupid is that? And I'm thinking, and. And I look back there and the fear is still in their eyes and the crocodile is nipping, trying to nip at their feet. And I turn around and I'm thinking, God, what, what, what should I do? What would a missionary do? Seven, you know, the pilots, they're up there reading the newspaper still. They don't even know a crocodile is on the plane. And I'm thinking, what should a missionary do? You know, big, strong, handsome missionary like myself. You know, what should I do to rescue 18 passengers, crocodile, and two pilots from plummeting into the sea? So I'm thinking, huh, we've got to do something about this. We've got to catch this crocodile. They brought it in a box. A little box. It chewed its way out of the box. The wrapping on its, on its mouth came off. And so I'm thinking, okay, me and this man, we've got to discuss what to do. So we're going to have a little powwow or something. So I turn around and, and I look and there is still fear in his eyes. And there's still fear in her eyes. And there's still fear in the little girl's eyes. But he points down again. And when I looked, I didn't see anything. The crocodile was gone. And you ever been in one of those moments where you just didn't want to turn around? <laughs> and so I'm just kind of looking at him and I'm looking down and I'm looking at her and I'm looking down and I'm looking at the little girl and I'm looking down and then finally I straighten myself up in my seat and I'm looking towards all the people and I see that their eyes are kind of looking down 
And I bend my head down and right between my feet, I saw these two little eyes <laughs> smiling with sharp teeth. <laughs> and I have this baby crocodile between my two legs. And I'm thinking, yeah, they didn't teach us this one either in Bible college. What do you do when a baby crocodile is between your two legs at 7,000 feet while the pilots are still reading the paper? Wow. Luckily, I had my red wing steel-toed boots on. And all of a sudden, I just lifted one leg up and before I could hardly move, that crocodile started eating the leather off the toe of one of my red wings. I mean, the leather was flying. His teeth was hitting the steel toe. I mean, sparks were flying, you know. I took my leg then and I, as hard as I could, I held that baby crocodile down on the ground. You wouldn't believe how strong a baby crocodile can be. He was lifting my leg up. I was pushing him down. He was lifting me up. His teeth were all over my boots. And I just very nonchalantly grabbed a hold of that man behind me as tight as I could. And I brought him up to where I was. And while I'm holding down this baby crocodile, I am telling him to grab it. And he doesn't want to grab it. And so I'm forcing him to grab it. And, and, and the people on the plane, their eyes are... And, and they're just looking and you know some of them are praying and others that are Catholic they're counting and, and they're doing everything and the pilots they're just reading the paper I thought wow wish I had a camera you know uh, yeah, right. finally after much much persecution in many ways I got that man to grab him then I took my hands and I grabbed him and then we took that little piece of string that he had in his hand and we finally with my other foot clamped down on that crocodile's mouth and was able to wrap it and wrap it and wrap it and wrap I was going to take my belt off too and wrap it and wrap it I was going to take the newspaper the pilot and just wrap it and wrap it and wrap it and finally got it shoved back in this little box and everybody went ah and then it was time for the pilots, you know, to land. We landed, and they never even knew. So for those little boys that asked me about that, I don't know if you're in this room, that room, one room over there, the nursery outside, wherever you're at, but you're somewhere, that is your crocodile story for this evening. All right. I could tell lots of stories. And hit people. A joy to be here. And thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to preach this evening. And I want to share a few thoughts with you, if I can. Two places to open up to. 2 Corinthians, chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians, chapter number 4, followed by Jeremiah, chapter number 18. 2 Corinthians, book of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 4. And I'm not going to be long in preaching this evening I know I won't get very, very far, but I want to share a few thoughts with you. Something to help you this evening. Something to encourage you, but something to remind you of as well. 2 Corinthians, in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. <clears throat> and there's many good verses here. Verse number 7 will begin. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. For we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed. Verse 10, the Bible says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. 
Paul goes on even farther, skipping down to verse 17. And you know what the Apostle Paul went through in his life. Verse number 17, he calls them what? Light afflictions. What's he say? For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, wow. Jeremiah chapter number 18, a very familiar passage as well, I'm sure. Chapter number 18 of the book of Jeremiah, verse number 1, the Bible says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, verse 2, the Bible says, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. Verse 4. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. I want to take a thought in verse number 4, where the Bible says the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. And if you'd let me just slightly digress a bit. Let me talk to you about something. What do you do when what's in your head is no longer in your hands? What do you do? Think of the potter. When what's in your head or can we even extend it to when what's in your heart? When what your desires are, your longings, your wishes, your goals in life, when it's up here, when it's down here, but no longer is it here. I'm talking about our ministries. I'm talking about pastor. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about our families. I'm, I'm talking about our homes. I'm talking about our marriages. I'm talking about our education. I'm talking about our future. I'm talking about our goals, our desires, our wants, our wishes, the things that we knew that God burdened our heart about and God helped formulate in our mind is now become dashed on the rocks of reality as our hands are empty with the dreams that were there. I have three things I want to give you and I might as well give them now because I'll probably never get back here. What do you do? That would be, I guess, my title when what's in your head is no longer in your hands. Number one, remember, God is still in control. Amen. God is still in control. I'll tell you what, in this world we live in, we are sure spinning, friends. But I'll tell you what, that old song that... Uh, that old Negro spiritual song that they sung many years ago, he's got the whole world in his hands. More truth in that song than you will ever, ever know. Remember, God is still in control. Recognize, number two, we're still clay. There's no Superman flying around this place, friend. We are still clay. Thirdly, not only recognize that we are clay, number two, but realize 
God always gives a second chance. God always gives a second chance. Friend, have you had goals and dreams? Ladies, have you had desires? Men, wants? Wishes? Ministries? Desires that have crept inside of you, whether quickly or little by little. Young people have desires crept into you that things you would like to accomplish. And you have felt this is what God wants. And all of a sudden, it's like a disaster when you look at the hands. It's like a marred, broken, cracked vessel within the hands that you hold. And you think never, ever will my wants, will my wishes, my desires ever, ever be fulfilled. Friend, just have a little hope. Just put your faith in the only one you can place it in. Because He has given the desires to you. He will see as the potter that the mars will be fixed. That the cracks will be taken, will be put back together again. Remember, He is still in control. Or oh, you can look at 1 Peter chapter number 4. I'll tell you what, were the trials of our life, the circumstances that God allows in your life, or in the life of a missionary, or in the life of a church leader, or a deacon, or, or, or the life of the pastor, what God allows in your life is basically troubles and trials followed by more troubles, more trials, completed by the last troubles and the last trials that He wants you to face. Why? He wants you to be like Him. He wants you to be a partaker of His suffering. He wants you to bear in your body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. We sing that little song, maybe you sing it, to be like Jesus. You know that? To be like Jesus. Oh, I ask to be like Him. Better watch what you sing. Yeah. Oh, that's a children's Sunday school song. Girls, you better watch what you play. Mm. Oh, I ask to be like Him. I'm thankful He'll never leave us. I'm thankful He'll never forsake us. I'm thankful He'll never run away from us. But when all this is happening, when your wants and desires, and even missionaries, some missionaries here this evening and those that have served on the foreign field and those that work within the continental U.S. that we live in here, I'm telling you something. Many times what we believe God wants us to do or we believe what God wants us to become is not happening just remember he's controlling it he is molding you and making you and shaping you and putting you right where you need to be and think about some things first of all as we just give a few thoughts and I'll turn it over to the pastor when all this is happening don't forget God knows your position. He knows your position. Zechariah chapter 4, you know what he says about the eyes of the Lord? They're everywhere, aren't they? They run to and fro. About the whole earth. They're, they're everywhere. Psalm chapter 139, there's not a place I can go that God is not there. He knows our exact position. I was in a meeting not too long ago in Brisbane, Australia, and we've had man, many, the preachers that were preaching, we were all in the pastor's office. We were having great fellowship. In fact, the church service was already starting. We could hear the music, but we were still enjoying fellowship. I don't get to be with other preachers very often. It's like, I'm here, I'm there. You live in a remote place, all you have is crocodiles, snakes, and crabs, you know? And mus sorry. Anyway... <laughs> 
I don't get that fellowship. And so I sneak off to Brisbane. I have a supporting church there. I have a great friend there who's the pastor. And we were having a meeting. And I'm, we're sitting in the office. And there's several senior missionaries that are in that office. We got several pastors from the United States of America. That they're sitting in that office as well. And we're all kind of gathered in a circle getting ready to pray. And this, one of the missionaries who used to pastor that church in Brisbane, Brother Wayne Shemish, very good friend of mine, missionary in Thailand. He looks at me and he says, before we pray, he says, Brother Gray, let me ask you a question. How can you stay in Papua New Guinea? How can you, st what does God do for you that allows you to stay in that God forsaken little place that you live in? Right next to him was Dr. David Gibbs, Jr. Right next to him was Dr. Paul Chapel, Lancaster Baptist. Pastor Doug Fisher, Lighthouse Baptist Church, San Diego, California. And they're all, <laughs> I'm on the spot. And I look at Brother Shemesh and I say, you know what keeps me on the field? God knows where I'm at all the time. God knows where I'm at all the time. Now, wives, I've got to tell you something. You are not always know where your husband is. All right? You may think, but, you know, he's here and he's there. Oh, he went to the store. No, he's at the hardware store. He's over here. No, he's over there. I think he's over here. No, uh, Men, I have to tell you that you won't always know where your wife is. If there's a yard sale, garage sale, anything like that, secondhand store, they'll, a dollar store. They love dollar stores, don't they? They'll be in every single one uh, uh, between here and Texas, all right? They'll be at every one. You don't always know where one another, you, you think you know where your children are. Oh, I know where my boy is. I'll give him a call right now. Oh, where are you at? You are. You don't always know where everyone is. And if you use that little GPS unit that you hang in your car and that lady tells you you're supposed to turn right and there's no road there or she tells you that you're supposed to go this direction and you're going to run right into a tree and that's the only time you're allowed to, to really legally cuss as a Christian is when the GPS is telling you not where, you know, the wrong direction. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, God, God knows the position. Amen. I got to Papua New Guinea several years ago, many years ago, in fact. And, you know, when I got there, I, I was living in the capital city. We were on the coast. I'm a coastal boy. Uh, I, I love the hot, hot weather and the rains and the humidity. You know, it just, Florida, you know, Florida is fine for me. I go on my inside, I'm cold. I go outside in the hot sun, I'm great. You go in the car after it's been in Walmart for two hours, you know, it's great. I love it. You just, <gasps> that, that's what Papua New Guinea is all about. That's where I live. I live in the humidity. I live in the heat. I still hope you come to visit me. Amen. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I just love it. But I was invited to go to the mountains for the first time to preach up in the Highland provinces. A good friend of mine said, I want you to come and preach in several of our bush churches. I said, wow, great. Got on a flight and got up to the mountains. And, you know, I'm at sea level. And we landed, we're at five and a half thousand feet. That's where the airstrip is. And then we start driving, and we go many, 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 many hours, and all of a sudden, we're just about at 8,000 feet above sea level. And, you know, he, he's got a short sleeve shirt on. And I'm dressed up like an Eskimo. You know, I got a coat on, a jacket, a hat, gloves, boots, and I'm, I'm shivering in the car because we're at 8,000 feet above sea level, and I'm not used to it. And you know what? We finally get to his house, and I'm hungry. Boy, am I hungry, and I am tired, and I am cold. And he says, we don't have time to eat. He says, there's a church waiting for us. <laughs> there is, yeah. You are the preacher. I said, I am. He said, yeah, you need to <laughs> preach in this national language of PNG, which we call pigeon. I said, I don't <laughs> preach in that language. I'm just a new missionary. And he says, well, just use any words that you can. They're looking forward to hearing John Gray preach. I said, where's the church? He says, you see that mountain up there? 
I said, you mean the one that has the clouds covering most of it? Yeah. He says, the church is on top of that mountain. I said, great. It's cold. The rain started to fall. I put on my coat. In about five minutes, I'm solid wet. I'm wet, 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 wet. In the mountains, you need big, good boots with good tread. Like a Goodyear tire, you know? <clears throat> Mine were smooth on the bottom. We took off on some mountain trail with several boys, and we start walking. I start falling. I start slipping. I start sliding. I go two or three steps up. I go two or three steps back. I go four or five up. I come back a couple. I am full of mud, water. I wore glasses at that time. You know what they do when it's raining and you're sweating and you can't see out of them, and you just want to throw them off the side, but you can't. I can't see a thing. I'm running into trees. I'm running into people. And now, it's dark. I can't see a thing. I have mud from head to toe. We walked two and a half hours, nearly three hours, and got to the halfway point. Now, I don't know about you, but I decided I would tell God a, little, a few little things that he needed to know. I said, God, I am wet. I am cold. I am hungry. I can't see. I'm shivering. I'm full of mud. Soaked from head to toe. I don't know where I'm at. I don't know where I'm going. And when I get there, I got to preach in a language that I can't even preach in. And I said, God, as we stop to rest, there are not any houses here. There's nothing but trees and bush and jungle and mud and rain. You probably don't even know where I'm at. You ever been that way? I'm being honest. I'm being transparent. You can look right through me and see love on the back. All right? I am being as transparent as I can be transparent. And you know what happened? There was a small little tiny hut of a something. It's like a little garden house. And there was smoke. You could see it in the darkness coming from the roof, the thatched roof. And all of a sudden the door, it wasn't a door, it was just a piece of bark that was beat into a door, flexible, was hanging over the door. We saw that little piece of bark move and the light from a fire penetrated out into the darkness. And I saw an old, I'm not talking about old, I'm talking about on the ark old, old lady could not hardly stand up straight. She stuck her finger out to us and went like this. The missionary looked at me and said, I think she wants us. The guys with us, the nationals, talked to her in the language and she said, this lady is inviting you two missionaries to sit by her fire. And all those frozen fingers started to unthaw. I took those boots off and got the water out. I took my socks off and I, I, I hung them on a, a on the wall and the, the fire the roaring fire was coming up and I was feeling warmth all over my body and I thought wow this is the greatest fire ever wow and I'm thinking I am so hungry what am I going to do and now that the shivering has stopped I open my eyes and I saw that lady put her hands in the ashes of that hot fire and she pulled out two baked sweet potatoes. And she put one 
in my hand. And she put one in the other missionary's hand. He prayed and we broke those open in that sweet potato smell, fully baked, just like Cracker Barrel, you know. <laughs> Went into my nostrils. And I put it back down. And I said, God, I am not deserving. Even before we began that journey, she probably, she had to have already put my dinner in the oven. She had no idea I was coming. But God did. She had a fire ready for us. She didn't know it was for me. But God did. We dried ourselves. We, we, we ate those sweet potatoes. We, well, I'll tell you what, we got ourselves encouraged and, and, and excited. And I got dressed again and put my everything back on. And you know, the rain has fallen even worse. And the mud is going to be even worse than it was before. And the darkness now is total darkness. But you know what? When I left that place, I was praising God that He knew exactly where I was. We walked two and a half more hours in the darkness. The lamp, Coleman lamp, went out. We only had one. I hit more trees. I fell down even more. You know what I did? I got up praising God. We sang songs. I was trying to figure out what I was going to preach. I was having the time of my life. And you know what? I got all the way up to the top. And I was tired, wet, muddy, and just praising God for what He has done. And you know what? That church was waiting for us for three hours. They sang through the songbook five times. <laughs> and as I walked in, I saw two ladies sitting on the outside. I didn't know why they were there. I had no idea. You know what I did? I grabbed one by one hand. I grabbed one by the other hand. And I said, ladies, we're going to church. And I pulled them inside. And the church was filled. I didn't have a place hardly to stand. So I, I put one lady on one side, one lady on the other side. And it was like standing room only. You know, Cornerstone Baptist Church, whatever. Anyway, they were, they were in the corners, just standing there in the corners. And they got done singing, you know, after the five times through the songbook. And all of a sudden, they said, and now they're talking in a language I don't even understand. John Gray's coming up to preach. And they all stand up. And they're just a clapping, clapping, clapping. And I'm still praying, God, what am I going to preach? And I stood up there and I was just praising God for what He has done. I couldn't preach. So you know what I did? I got the Bible in their language and I just stumbled through Romans chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. Went to Rome. I went through the Romans road stumbling like a little baby just learning how to walk. I got done. Amen. Told the pastor there. Give the invitation. From that corner and from that corner came those two ladies who attended a Lutheran church but were ostracized from their families because of something that happened in their life. Those two ladies came down and knelt at the altar and asked Jesus Christ to come into their heart and save them from their sins. Man, we were rejoicing. Those people in that church were rejoicing. She, they were relatives of some of the people in that church. We were all praising God. And then when we got done, we had five hours to slide down the mountain in the darkness. <laughs> Friend, I'm telling you something. God knows your position. God knows your position. He knows exactly where you are. And I'm going to tell you something. Ten years later, just about exactly ten years later, you know what happened? I was invited to go to a station, a government station, very close to that area and preach 
And now I can preach in their language. And, and now I can communicate. And, you know, now I can be eloquent, you know, and I can say the right things. And, and we could drive and I didn't have to walk. And, you know, the rain wasn't falling, so everything was cool. And so what they did, they put three big tents together. And they went and got the word out that John Gray was coming to preach. And everyone is required to come. That's exactly what they said. You are required. We, the Catholics emptied out their church. The Lutherans emptied out their churches. All the little Baptists, they all... 3,000 people for five nights met in that tent as I preached to them. Over a hundred souls were saved in that meeting. And boy, we were praising God the last night. I got done preaching and I'm tired and it's done. And you know, you preach five nights in a row, you've preached all your messages you've ever, you know, you ever gotten together. So I, just, I was preaching the same stuff over and over again, giving the same illustrations, just different, you know, evangelistically speaking, you know, stretching it a little bit. I got done. The invitation was given, Pastor. Invitation was done. And all of a sudden, I looked way in the back. And when you put three tents together, it's kind of hard to see what's happening in the very back. Two ladies came walking down the aisle. I didn't know who they were. They came all the way to the front and just stood there with their heads bowed. One of the pastors went over and asked them what they needed. He came up to the platform and he said, these ladies want to talk to you. And I'm thinking, you know, what did I do? What did I say? You know, what's going on? Do they have any guns, knives, whatever? Uh, what's happening here? So I walked down there and through an interpreter, they said, we want to give you a love offering. They gave me just a small amount of money probably not worth more than two or three dollars in the United States money. And they said, we want to give you this offering. It's all we have. We don't have any more. And I said, God bless you ladies, but why, why do you want to give this offering to me? They said, because ten years ago, you walked five hours up a mountain in the pouring down rain and came into our village and you grabbed us by the hand and you pulled us into the church. And we both got saved. Amen. And we want to tell you, we have led nearly all of our relatives to the Lord the last 10 years. I was humbled. Tears started rolling down my cheeks. I said, can you tell me your names? They said, our names are not important. You don't need to know our names. What's important is you keep doing what God wants you to do wherever God wants you to do it. Wow. God's in control. And He knows your position. You know, I have so much here, but I've got to close. But he also, I'll end with this, appointed your place. First Peter chapter 4, friend, God put you where you are. No, it's, by, it's not by chance. Oh, I'm just lucky. No, you're not lucky. God has placed you in the trouble, in the trial, in the tribulation that you might think that you are in, in the family that you are in. God has appointed your place. 
Not only does he know where you're at, he puts you there. Don't you undersee? Don't you I understand? God has placed you in the position you are in. You young ladies ought to say, thank God He has put me in the family that He has put me in. You men ought to say, thank God He has placed me at Cornerstone Baptist Church right where God wants me to be. He's appointed your place. You know, you know, I fly a lot when I go to Australia back and forth and in Papua New Guinea I have to fly to other places when I'm preaching or visiting some of the other missionaries or schools that uh, we've tried to work and start and I also work with the government in their schools so I have to travel quite a bit especially in the past and in travel I always have bad times at airports. And sometimes in airplanes like the crocodile story there's always some excitement inside the airplane or at the airport. In fact, one time I was at Brisbane and I was talking to a man about, about is a man that I knew. I was talking to him about the Lord. And I, I had some lady yell at me in the Brisbane International Airport. She scared me half to death because she came up from behind me after she heard me talk about God and she had her face pierced. 26 times and just she started yelling at me when I turned around I jumped I thought I saw you know I thought someone shot her with a shotgun or something you know she had so many holes in her head I've never seen anybody like that before she had so much iron in her face it scared me half to death and she's yelling at me telling me I'm a holy roller telling me everything else and then finally she says if you're waiting for Jesus to come back when he comes back I'm not going with him and I thought if he has a magnet in his pocket you are sister <laughs> wow airports always always get me anyway I was flying to Brisbane just a few years ago after I lost my wife my wife uh, many years died of cancer and uh, after her death I was going back to Brisbane to preach at the Good Shepherd Baptist Church. And they gave me one of the first class or business class seats in this smaller plane. And I'm thinking, wow, I never get to do this. And that's exciting. And so I get everything. And it comes to find out two of us had the same seat. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but, you know, I guess airlines are known for overbooking flights. Anyway, this was a three-hour international flight from Port Moresby, capital city of PNG, to Brisbane, Australia, the capital of Queensland. And I thought, ah, ah, that's my seat. And there is a man sitting in my seat. And, you know, we're going to have to go outside and fight this out or something. What's going to happen? Who is going to get this seat? Finally, I thought, oh, I am so tired. All I want to do is sleep. And there was a lady next to him holding a baby. And I thought, buddy, you got it. You can have that seat. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Do you have another seat for me? Yes. Yes, Mr. Gray. We'll put you way there in the back. So I'm walking, walking. Everybody's already loaded up, put their stuff away. There's no space anywhere to put in your cargo. I go all the way to the back, and there's an old elderly lady sitting down, and one seat vacant. That's mine. So I sit down and buckle in. Didn't realize she's afraid of flying. And as soon as the engine started, she grabbed a hold of my arm. And I thought, oh, Grandma, what's happening here? She says, I'm just afraid. I'm just, I just, I, I, I've been in Pop New Guinea. I said, well, I said, listen, listen, listen. I said, everything's going to be fine. I fly all the time on this airplane. There's no problem. Got good pilots. They even got good coffee on it. Amen. Everything's going to be good. You can just sit back and close your eyes. And three hours later, we'll be in Brisbane. Everything will be cool. No, not to worry. Just, just everything's fine. And so she's still shaking, still shaking. And all of a sudden we're taking off and she's gripping a little bit tighter, you know. And I'm just hoping the vice grip, you know, will loosen up a little bit as she le lets go of my arm. And we're just sitting there and I'm saying, hey, it's a good flight. Everything's going to be fine. No turbulence. Hey, it's just going to be a great flight. And she looks at me with tears in her eyes. And she says, I just lost my husband. I've come to Papua New Guinea for a few days to pay respects to him and, and all of a sudden has God ever hit you hard with something I don't know what he hits with but boy it hurts 
God hit me so hard. I, I was so selfish. I wanted that seat up in first class. I didn't want, I, you know, I got to sit next to this lady who's afraid of flying. And I just lost a wife. And she has just lost a husband. And I said, God, I know why this seat was open. For me to help her. And I said, ma'am, I am very sorry to hear that. I said, I just lost my wife to cancer just a few short years ago. You won't believe the next statement that came out of her mouth. She said, I just lost my husband in September 1942. He was shot down by a Japanese zero in World War II. Every day, this lady has grieved. This strong Catholic believing lady has grieved since 1942. She showed me a picture of his plane and of this handsome, dashing young man by the plane. She says, that's the last time I saw him. That's the last time I saw his plane. He crashed in the mountains of central province of Papua New Guinea. Plane caught on fire and burned. There was nothing remaining. Since 1942, September, I have grieved every day for him. I said, God, I know why you put me in this place. For the next three hours, I shared every verse of scripture and passage and illustration I could share to encourage her about the Lord. I witnessed to her. I prayed with her. We then cried together. We read the Bible together. We cried together. We prayed together. We did everything we could do in three hours. And she says, I am going to look up all these verses again. When I get home. I said ma'am you need to be saved. She said you have put some things in front of me. But she says I have seen what this grace has done for you. Just pray that it's done for me. Not too long ago I was in Brisbane once again to preach. And I called her. She says, I just want you to know I trusted Jesus as my own personal Savior. I think I can start letting go. You see, grief is related to anger, isn't it? But sorrow, that, that's a healing. But grief is an anger. And all those years, over a half a century... She has been grieving. Praise God for her salvation. Friend, God appoints your place. Don't ever think He's put you in the wrong church. Don't ever think that He has put you in the wrong family. Don't ever think that he has been fooled and something has come by his desk that, you know, just like some office, something goes by and the secretary does No, 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 no. Don't think that anything sneaks by God. He knows your position. He appointed your place. And one day... What's been up here? What's been down here? You're going to see it here. I've had wants and wishes and desires and dreams of Papua New Guinea and what God could do. And you know what? It seemed like year after year there was nothing. Year after year there was nothing. Year after year there was nothing. And all of a sudden, in certain areas of our ministry, we saw it blossom and, and mushroom and grow unbelievably. The potter 
Yeah, it was a bit marred. The vessel was cracked. Deemed by men as useless. Thrown away and start again. No, he made it again. He made it again. As I close, I just, I just want to ask you, don't give up on him. Don't give up on the one who knows you, the one who loves you, the one who has placed you where you're at. Gentlemen, let me tell you something. You have not lost your wife, Thank the Lord for it. But one day you may. I thank the Lord that he has brought a young beautiful lady into my life to fill a void. And I thank God every day. We've been married 12 days. We're still on our honeymoon. Wow. But don't you ever think God made a mistake. My first wife, right after we were married, had problems and physical problems, and we went to the mission field just a little over a year after we were married, in fact, and were there for many years, and all of a sudden the cancer was found. When the cancer was found, you know what it's like, series of operations, scannings, testings, radiation, chemo, you, you know what it's all about. I would not wish it upon any living soul on the face of God's earth. But I can stand here and say God makes no mistakes. He makes no mistakes. No, it's not easy. I want to tell you a story and I'll close. At one point we thought her cancer was gone. Maybe we wanted to think that. I don't know. The doctors were very positive. Maybe they were wrong. I don't know who was wrong. Went back to Australia where testing could be done. You know what they said? Hey, you're all clear. Come back in another six months for all the... Wow. Great. Went back to Papua New Guinea, serving, working, and all of a sudden she started feeling bad once again. We got on a plane and we went back to Australia. And when we got there, they wanted to do all the testing and the CAT scans and everything and all the blood work. They did it, did it, worked on it. And we were supposed to get the results back on a Wednesday morning. That Wednesday evening, like tonight, I'm supposed to be preaching at the church. The pastor is waiting, wanting me to preach, so I'm going to be preaching that evening. Wednesday morning, we're sitting at the oncologist's office waiting for her to show up, and she gets called to another hospital, and we're still waiting for her to show up. We've been to Subway twice already, eating, eating lunch and eating supper at, down at the bottom of the hospital, and, and we're waiting, and it's already 6 o'clock. Church is at 7, and the oncologist rushes in because she knows we're there to see her. And she comes in and she says, I I'm sorry, it's been a very hectic day for me, but I'm going to have to ask you to come back tomorrow. And I said, Doctor, I said, you've just about killed us today by allowing us to wait. And I'm sorry, it was out of your control, but couldn't you have sent some type of word to us and she says I'm not allowed to do that she says out of my mouth only I need to tell you and your wife that the cancer has spread into her liver into her lungs and about 30 20 minutes later we were sobbing like babies she said, Mr. Gray, we cannot permit your wife to leave Australia. She cannot go back to Papua New Guinea. 
They will not accept her on the airline. We have to start chemotherapy radically this week. I'm supposed to be preaching here in a few minutes, remember? We walk out of that office and it's like <laughs> everything is gone. And I'm again questioning God. We're coming down the elevator and I, I, I'm weeping, I'm, I'm, I'm crying and, and, and I look over to Mary She's fine. And it's bothering me. I don't. We get out and go to the car park and walk up to the car and get it unlocked. And, and I don't know how to put the key in. I don't know how to start. You ever been that way? Just, you don't, you can't think. And, and I get the car started. And, you know, they drive on the other side of the road there. And I'm fine with that. It, it's fine. It's just here that I'm not fine anyway. Just, and I, I pull out. And I'm going to pull on the opposite side of the road. We're talking about a, a busy, we're talking about something like a highway. Cars everywhere and it's dark. I've got to rush to church. I've got to preach. They just said my wife only has a few months to live. She's not going to be able to come back home. And all this is happening. I'm saying, God, no! And I'm holding the steering wheel so tight. And she looks at me. And she says, John, what's wrong? I'm about to pull the steering wheel out. I'm driving in rush hour traffic. I've got to preach in 30 minutes and it takes 40 to get to the church. And I yell, I will not let you go. And I can't preach tonight. She taps me on the shoulder. Men, did your wife ever, ever just give you a little tap on the shoulder? And she says, John, you will preach tonight. And I'm not yours, I'm his. I don't belong to John Gray. I belong to the lover of my soul. Wow. God put me there, didn't he? God put her there, didn't he? There's been countless people saved because of her illness and death. oncologists, nurses, doctors, you name it. Someone even opened up a small little hospital in Papua New Guinea, up in the mountains, and named it after my wife, my late wife. God appointed that place for me, for her. And God has appointed your place and has placed you and positioned you where you are. So, when your desires, dreams, and hopes, and wishes don't seem to be uh, catching up with your hands, just think on these couple thoughts. He's still in control. Yes, I lost a wife and loved her greatly. And God has given a new one whom I love greatly.
the Lord gave, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God bless you and thank you very much. What a great opportunity. Be able just to share a few thoughts with some very good people at Cornerstone Baptist Church. God bless you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.